Good day, it's Tony Fortunato from The Technology Firm, and we're going to talk a little bit about a broadcast analysis. And I've talked about this in many other articles, and I have not done an article on this in a long time, so I thought it's time for an update. And broadcast analysis will include everything within that VLAN, subnet, and or broadcast domain. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, it's not just going to be about your PCs, it's whatever else is in that VLAN. So broadcasts, they can actually cause network slowdowns. And a good symptom to look for is an intermittent or random issue. So a device will slow down, a device will freeze. Uh, Low-end devices, IoT devices, will typically freeze right up or reboot. And rebooting is kind of good in a way because it comes back online. The bad thing about rebooting is if you're not paying attention, you'll never find out there was an issue, right? You also find it'll affect Wi-Fi. You'll have unreliable or slow Wi-Fi and in the next slide you'll see a little chart that will explain some of the math that I'm getting at right now. You can also find unpredictable application or window client performance. It's all part of the same thing. Slow, fast, slow, fast, just performance issues in general. Now the, the byproduct of all that when you are doing protocol analysis using Wireshark or whatever you want to use there's extra packets or I call them space junk floating around that you have to sift through because guess what they're extra protocols. Extra services equal extra protocols equal extra packets on the wire. Now I've done this quite a few times even wrote an article about this. A 10% broadcast storm can lock up a lot of devices, wind terms, access points, um, IoT devices, printers, all that kind of stuff. Whereas a 90% broadcast storm will do nothing. And it all depends on the size of those packets. Again, in the next slide, you will see a chart that will identify why that is so. Now, you have to also remember that every packet on the wire that's a broadcast or a multicast will result in an interrupt, either within your NIC or within your PC. So a lot of interrupts equals a performance issue and that's pretty well how to see that. Now with this chart, um, you really get to find out why that's the case. If you take a look here, you'll see that a 90% broadcast or multicast storm of 1518 byte packets, that's the maximum ethernet size for most clients, and I'm not including jumbo frames, that's a whole other conversation. So on a 100 meg link, again, I'm keeping this very conservative, at 7,411 packets per second. So if you have a gig link, just move that comma over and it's 74,000. That's how many packets or interrupts per second on that computer or host. Now, here's this is where things get a little confusing. You would think 10% is fine then. It's not, because if it's 10% but a smaller packet size on the same link, that's 19,000 packets per second or 195,000 packets per second on gig ethernet. So again, a little review, 7,400 on a 100 meg link using a big packet, 19,000 on that same link using 64 byte packets. And broadcast and multicast packets are typically small. So you're not gonna find a 1500 byte broadcast or multicast packet. So it's really important to remember that when you see a broadcast or multicast storm, don't look at the utilization, 10%, 5%, 11%. Look at the packets per second, because that's typically what's going to cause you an issue. So down below, this this table down below is simple math, right? All I did was bandwidth is in bits, frame sizes are in bytes, 8 bits in a byte, and there you go. So you can easily replicate this chart in Excel, calculator, whatever you want to use, and you really get an idea of how many packets per second are flying around your network. And this also explains why gig devices, when the first uh, generation of gig devices came out, uh, they couldn't really achieve the bandwidth that they were promised because of this simple math uh, when you talk about just performance in general. So when you look at your VLAN, this is what I said a little earlier, so I got a little graphic to illustrate the point. Um, you've got a physical switch, but that VLAN can extend past that physical switch depending on how your network's configured. So on a VLAN, for example, this one, I see a server, I see a PC, I see some phones, I see obviously some cameras, of course Wi-Fi, right, there's an access point on there, printer, an IoT logo means a bunch of Internet of Things, it could be a, I don't know, thermostat, whatever, that kind of stuff. And then of course a laptop sitting on that same VLAN. And actually I'll be honest with you, just about a month ago I was on a network and this was the exact case, everything was on one VLAN. Now. There's a whole argument behind, should you split up your VLAN? 
and and this this is I'm going to say up to everybody's discretion. But if you do have a lot of broadcasts, as I saw on this network, and you do want to at least minimize the amount of broadcasts you see from your client's perspective, you might want to take the clients off and put them on their own VLAN. There's a whole security argument as well, which I'm going to leave alone right now. But it doesn't make sense to set up a VLAN if you have one camera, right? But you may want to set up a VLAN for all your IoT devices or all your printers. So if you have a large group of devices, you may want to put them just on their own broadcast domain to limit the amount of broadcast and multicast that the client and or server would see. So anything um, anything that sticks that's connected to your network, either Wi-Fi or cabled, is going to send out a broadcast or multicast packet. It doesn't matter if it's a printer or a computer, it doesn't matter, but you're always going to see these packets flying around. So you should find out what the source of these packets are and how to minimize them. So here's an example of the typical packets you see floating around. Uh, exterior routing protocols, and this is a very good, very good point because exterior means outside. So if your routers are configured with EIGRP or whatever, that's on the outside, not the inside of the, of the network. But many routers by default will send them both ways. So you might want to make sure the exterior protocols stay exterior and the interior protocols stay interior. You've also got misconfigured standard PC builds. I see this all the time. You've got all the protocols lumped on your PC, and you think, so what? Big deal. But when you multiply that by 10, 50, 100 computers, you start to gamble on performance. And then you've got your example of excessive protocols, and there's a whole litany of them. And what it boils down to is what do you need? So a good example is IPX. So some printers out there still have IPX on it from the Novell days. You could probably do away with just do it. <laughs> excuse me, do away with it. Same with LLC or NetBuoy. Probably don't need that. IPv6, and this is a very simple argument for me. If you are an IPv6 shop, great. Then you don't need IPv4. If you're an IPv4 shop, then you probably don't need IPv6. Some cases you might need both as you transition, but in most cases it's one or the other. Spanning tree, if you're not using spanning tree and it's uh, not an issue or a design criteria, you can get rid of that because that can cause some issues. So on and so on and so on. So you should make sure that whatever broadcasts you see are accounted for on your network. So how do you figure this stuff out? Get yourself a protocol analyzer like Wireshark or Microsoft Netmon, they're free. And what you're going to do is just simply start a capture from your computer. Make sure your computer's idle. Don't have your browser and Outlook and all that nonsense running. Just have nothing running on it. And if you did have stuff running in the background and you don't want to include yourself, just simply create a capture filter excluding your MAC address. So in Wireshark, it's down here. Not space ether space host and your MAC address. I've also put it up here in the note. Now I always suggest you just set up an 8 meg capture buffer and just have a capture trigger to stop capturing after 8 meg. So as I said in this slide, start your PC, leave it alone, go for lunch, whatever. In some cases, that 8 meg will fill up in an hour or 10 minutes or 3 seconds. It all depends how much stuff's floating around your network. Come back and review that trace file that you just captured. Now, I might just want to add something to that. You probably want to save the trace file as soon as you're done. Don't just start working on it in case something should go wrong. Just save it. Save it as, you know, broadcast VLAN 1 or, or whatever you want to call it. So for most people, step one involves looking at the screen and yelling, holy bleep. Well, there's a better approach. So if you go to statistics and protocol hierarchy, you can actually see all the protocols that are flying around. Um, the hard part of the exercise is to have an idea or a guesstimate or a gut feel of what protocols should be on your network, not what is, what should. Now, it's discouraging and very distracting when you come to this point and an analyst will grumble I don't know what that is, but there's only a few of them, so forget it. And in that case, I, I, I say the opposite. It only takes one packet to cause a problem. So if you're really not sure what it is, that's what you should really investigate. If you know what it is, and there's a few of them, and you want to skip them, that's a different argument. But the good approach is not to go through eight megs in one shot. Right? You're eating a steak dinner. You're not going to swallow the steak in one bite. You're going to take a bite at a time. So you can pick away at this trace whenever you have a moment you're on hold or whatever you're doing and you want to five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour here and there, and you'll find that you'll get more out of it doing it that way. So then we pick a protocol. So for example, IPX, I know I don't need IPX, so let's get rid of it. So I'm going to filter on IPX. So if I right click on it, apply as filter and select it, 
At the top, Wireshark, in this case, will actually put IPX in the display filter. Later on in life, you don't have to do this. You can just type IPX, and that will give you the same result. Now I get a list of all the addresses that I found with IPX. The key here is this. Click Limit to Display Filter. When you click that, everything you see in this chart is only IPX. Anything that conforms to the display filter that I had earlier. It could be a MAC filter, an IPX filter, it doesn't matter. Okay? And then I can filter on that MAC address. Here we go. ETH.ADDR, Ethernet address equals equals, and then that Ethernet MAC address. And you can clearly see this guy has IPX. It also has IP. I can see he's registering his name or broadcasting his name, and it's Mo. The name is Mo, and the IP address is 10.10.10.11. So now I know what it is, and it's only one, so it's probably misconfigured or has something specific on it or different on it that put IPX on it. This is a great little example also to go through your machines uh, when you want to find out if it has a virus, a trojan, or if it's just configured properly. It's the same methodology. So I hope that helps. I'm going to also do another broadcast analysis uh, slides or video probably in the next week or two, and I'm going to take it to the next level and start covering some other broadcast analysis techniques. Have a good day. Bye for now.